Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. I'm a midlife millionaire coach and a certified financial planner, and I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors and thought leaders who are on that leading edge. So join us for conversations on money, business, health, and inspiration, so you can live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hello, everyone. This is Katana, and I want to welcome you to Smart Women Talk. Today, we're going to be interviewing the author. She's an author and feng shui expert, and she's a clutter coach. Her name is um, Tisha Morris, and her book is Clutter Intervention. So we're going to be talking about how changes to your home can cause a ripple effect, strategies to declutter your office, and the power of decluttering and the impact it can have on your life. So let me tell you about um, our guest. Um, Tisha Morris is a best-selling author. She's a feng feng shui expert, business coach, and she holds a degree in law and fine arts and a fine arts degree in interior design. She combines feng shui techniques, designs aesthetic coaching and intuition to turn challenging spaces into supportive environments. So Tisha, (laughs) thanks so much for being here and welcome to Smart Women Talk. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And thank you for that great introduction. Uh, You're welcome. Our listeners have a really strong community of women who are really looking to reinvent their lives. And many of them want to move from their corporate careers into what I call like a lifestyle career. And I noticed that you've done that. You talked about it also in a book. How did you go from practicing law to becoming a feng shui practitioner? Yeah, it was a quite a long journey. I'm not one of those people that's going to quit my job and jump off a cliff. I'm pretty risk averse at the same time. I'm not one to stay in situations that don't feel good either. So I found a stroke of balance and it was really over a period of about eight years that I made that transition. And I, in part of the bridge into that from law into the healing arts was yoga. That was a big part of my path. But on a more scholastic level, I got an interior design degree while I was still practicing law. That kind of in a roundabout way led me to feng shui. And so there was several years where half the day I was practicing law and half the days I was working in people's faces. So it was not a, it was not a seamless, or I guess you could say it's seamless, but it was not a direct one day I'm doing law and the next day I'm a feng shui consultant. And I also also do business coaching and help people transition careers. And I think it's important to strategize and, and come up with a plan. You know, during that time, I did a lot of my own downsizing. And in that downsizing, did a lot of my own clutter interventions, with myself and found that actually was a big part of the process as well. Downsizing partly for financial reasons, you know, move to a smaller home and things like that, which of course forces you to, you know, release some items. Uh, so that was definitely a physical manifestation of the process that I was undergoing internally as well. And was there a specific instance that really got you inspired that this is going to be your life purpose? Yeah. When I was practicing law, I was I, I, I vividly remember just sitting at my desk, looking out over the city. At this time, I was living in Nashville, and I just felt myself needing to be not in an office and um, shuffling papers. I felt that I had within me a real skill and knowledge and passion to directly help people in their day-to-day lives. And I didn't know what that would look like at the time. And so I was drawn to interior design. I did not know that when I was in my collegiate years. Unfortunately, I could have could have saved some time that with that. But I went back to school for that. But then that still wasn't quite fitting the bill. I still needed something that was a little more creative. And even though interior design sounds creative, it's actually very technical. And so that's when I fell into yoga, which led me to energy healing and energy work. And that began to have that that's the first time I had not been bored with my work was when I was working with the subtle realms of energy. And as of course, aspects of myself were opening up that I didn't realize I had intuition, for example. So that became very interesting. (laughs) And and of course, just the one-on-one help seeing a direct correlation and help on my day-to-day work with clients was finally fulfilling. And so this kind of all circled around to fun- incorporating feng shui into my work. And once I did that, it's one of those people say, if you want to know what you're supposed to be doing, what do people ask you for? 
And I found people were asking me for feng shui. They were, they might not say the word feng shui, but they would say, can you help me with my home? Or can you help me hang pictures? Or can people started asking me for feng shui services? And I honestly couldn't get away from it. I, it wasn't something I was actually like, oh, this is what I want to do. It's, it's one of those things and I'm sure you and so many other people can relate to. It's one of those things that comes so easy and natural that you don't give it a lot of credit. <laughs> yeah. And that's what they say. Find out what you're great at. Ask people, what is it that's so easy for you? Or that you, what is your natural talent? And then that really can lead you to your passion and to what your unique abilities and skills are. So you have all these books. Can you just briefly talk about the different books you have and then how you progressed writing each one? Definitely. So to pick up on my story of how I could not get away from feng shui, my first book that was published, Feng Shui Your Life, honestly came out of nowhere. It was another one of those things, okay, I can't get away from that. It got published pretty easily. And I shudder to say that because I know that's not an easy feat for folks. And so I had the book Feng Shui Your Life, which is a pretty short, very tip heavy book. But that really jump started my career. And from there, I'd been working on actually for years prior to that, what became my book Mind, Body, Home. And this book was really born out of my experiences with this home I renovated. And as I was renovating it, aspects of myself were being renovated. And that was actually during the time when I was transitioning from being an attorney to the healing arts. And so my house was taking on my sub-personalities or what was being transformed and vice versa. And so that actually became the book Mind, Body, Home. And that really broke down the house into every part and component and tells you what its mental and emotional correlation is. It's really fascinating. It also has a lot of good, just basic feng shui rules in, in it as well. And so that was my second book, even though it was my first baby in some ways. And then after my practice continued to progress, I began to teach through my certification course students to become feng shui consultants. And in that process, realized that there was a void in the feng shui libraries of books on the five elements. And so I wrote a book dedicated solely on the five elements of feng shui. And then when I was about done with all my writing, my mother passed away in 2016 suddenly. And that kind of had a domino effect of me having the passion to discuss clutter. I talked about it a lot in my first book, but I really wanted to dive deep into the psychology of why we hold on to the things we hold on to. And that became Clutter Intervention. And that's my most recent release. Yeah, and that's the one I just listened to on tape. And I have the printed version. And now I, I really feel I need to go through it again. I'd like to spend some time on that, on the clutter in intervention, if we can. That would be wonderful. And when I'm wondering why, when, in listening to you, covered so many different areas in the book, the, the relationships and why we hold on to things. Why is it we have such a hard time letting things go, whether it's photographs or maybe books that we have? It seems like we, why is it we have such a hard time just letting that stuff go and simplifying? It comes down to one very simple but not easy thing, and that is identity. I asked myself at the outset of writing the book that question, and that's really what that's the question that started the, the whole book. I was on a podcast years ago and the podcast interviewer asked me, why is it that when I go to the store, my two-year-old just has this innate desire to put all this stuff in the cart? And so that actually, I, that began my exploration because I'm like, why at such an early age are we already prone to stuff? And the reason why it's very easily explained in psychology round two is when we go through this individuation. And that's when we realize that things are separate from ourselves. So you're separate from me. The table is separate from me. My toy is separate from me. And as soon as the ego separates, then the idea of possession begins to take root. And when something's separate from you, then you can possess it. And you want to possess it because it's an aspect of yourself. So from a child's perspective, it's toy. Why a child gets so angry when its toy is taken away from it or so another kid comes is because it's like the kid taking away its left arm. Okay. And so this really never goes away. The terrible twos, we are all still in it. And so we, the sweater from high school is still part of an identity. The mug that I'm drinking out that has some kind of pers personification of myself is a part of me. And so it's all about these identities that our stuff represents. And so the real question is, in your decluttering process, 
is this an identity that I still want to have or that's no longer applicable to my current life? So with every item, as we're going through, right? (laughs) Let's say... I was just thinking when you were talking about it, I have a really nice kitchen that has great places to put all the appliances and silverware and that. But one of the drawers that is just so difficult is where I put all the big utensils. And it's in the things have to dig around in there. And there's just too much stuff. A lot of the stuff I, I probably have never used. And I don't know. Years ago, my husband said, honey, I got a surprise for you. I cleaned out the kitchen for you. (laughs) I got rid of the stuff that I don't think you need. And another time he says, I cleaned out your junk drawer in the bedroom. I was horrified. And so because there was so much junk, I never even knew what he got rid of. (laughs) So I think he did a good job. But I remember being so angry at him. Have you run into anything like this before? (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. That is an unusual with couples and clutter as a whole. We can go there. I, I, that usually comes up within, within about five or 10 minutes of any talk or workshop, <laughs> how couples handle clutter among themselves. It's so much easier to point the finger at the other person of, you have clutter issues and I don't. Even if there's a, the neat freak and the pack rat come together, they're flip sides of the same coin in some, some aspect. But usually what I see is the clutter just shows up in different ways. For example, someone's clutter might be very spread out into the, into the, onto the visual surfaces, whereas the other's clutter is more hidden away, but it's still clutter's clutter. Give us some stories of what you've run into with individuals in relationships where something like that happens, how you've helped them and what the issue was and maybe what the solution was. Sure. So let me give a little bit of context, though, of my approach. People say, where do I start, you know, with their entire house? And my answer is, what area of your life do you want to change? Or where are you challenged in what area of your life? And that's where you begin. It's not necessarily in your house. That could be, I mean, I could come to your house and I could I could like be a detective and fill out the areas and I can tell you from being in your house what different areas represent because of feng shui. But if I approach the whole topic of decluttering from the position of bettering your life in some way, if you're telling me that you either want a relationship or want to improve upon the current relationship, then, then we would look toward to items that relate to relationship. And same way with career. If you are transitioning careers or having problems in your current career, then we would look to the areas, the things and areas of the home that relate to career. With regards to relationships, for those people wanting to attract a relationship, the number one and quickest way to do it is to clear out items from past relationships. And that could be from past marriage, divorces, could just be a two-week relationship. And it's the Instagram photos. Now our digital world is like part of the clutter process as well. That's where I like to begin. And gosh, with relationships, it can be more complex if you live together, in which case you shared furniture. And it's not like you have you can afford to necessarily get get rid of everything that you share together. But there's some considerations that might be worth it in some cases. And people Um, get in such fights about this stuff, and then maybe they're better off releasing a lot of it, right? It carries associations in our mind. We could say that also carries energy, but we don't even have to go that far to believe in energy, but just the memories that you have with it. For example, I have a client with with a sofa and from a previous relationship. And it, it, it makes sense to to keep the sofa because it's it's expensive to replace. But every time she came home and sat on the couch, it just reminded her of the past relationship that, that failed and all that went along with all that. And so that was a situation that, you know, when it was financially feasible and appropriate, and then I encouraged her to go ahead and think about replacing that couch. And so, and the thing about it is that we are, when we go through big life changes, we are different on the other side of it. And most of the times, our things are just physical expressions of ourselves. And most of the time, our tastes and preferences and likes, it seems trivial, but it's not. It's their expressions of ourselves. And usually we are changed after big experiences. Another example was of a, a woman who married kids, the whole thing. And they were in a very well-to-do situation in life, had a really large home. And then the 2008 crash took them out and they went through bankruptcy, 
had to downsize to an apartment. And so she was hanging on to a lot of the old furniture from the house that she admittedly did not even like anymore. The furniture, the, the like lamps, for example. And so she couldn't figure out why she's still holding on to these lamps and some other decor items along that line. And of course that takes up space, especially when you're in a smaller space, you don't have storage. And, and so once I helped her realize that these lamps are just a representation of, of, of the affluent times in her life and just that it's actually a moment of just releasing there's going to be some emotion that might come up, which is, of course, what we're all resisting when going through the decluttering process, usually why we, we stop and don't do it. And so anyway, she had a moment and had that realization and, and admitted that she didn't, that her taste, her decor taste is so much different than it was before. And it's not even that she even wanted to go back to that time of her life because she is so, was so changed by the experience. It was just this 1% of still holding on to what she didn't even know she was still holding on to. And then once she realized it, it was, she let all the stuff go the next day. You talk about a lot of psychological things in your book and even the hero's journey. I love that and how that fits in right now. But when you said dealing with the emotions that come up. Can you just explain what that means and give us an example? Because I have all these things that belong to my children or belong to my mother or my great aunt, and I'm storing them all and displaying them all. And I'm hoping that my children will get their own places. I can give them my china cabinet with all the stuff in it. But getting rid of any of this stuff to me is very difficult. It's not going to be difficult so much to give it to them. But if they don't want it, I think then I'm going to go into a lot what you talked about, the guilt. And and I think I'm going to have a very hard time dealing with it. Yeah, that you, you just hit on like a whole minefield of topics. Um. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And, there, and you could, yeah, you're speaking for so many people. So let, yeah, let me uh, break it down a bit. Let me first make a distinction between decluttering and organizing. Okay. Because okay. a lot of times or, organizing is just needing to get organized. Decluttering is needing to get rid of things. Okay. So okay. I can only speak to decluttering. I'm not an organizer. I'm pretty organized, but not an organizer. <laughs> um, and so in decluttering, we're getting rid of things. And so in getting rid of things, we're letting things from the past go. Everything in your home is something from the past, unless you just now came home from the store. Everything in your house is from the past. Mm -hmm. And so what part of the past do you want to keep carrying forward? Because your home is basically a giant living vision board. And so whatever is in your home is just beaming out. And so for those who practice law of attraction, your house is your biggest emitter of energy it's just an extension of your self emitting energy. And it's basically a giant vision board of what you want more of what from the past that you already have, do you want more of? So even mm. the out of date curtains, you're going to get more out of date things, thing, identities from the past. You're going to get more aspects regarding that. So begin to switch your perspective on, because there's a lot from that you already have that you do want to keep. There's things that you do want to keep. And in fact, the decluttering process is as much about what you want to keep as what you want to get rid of. Because what you keep sends a big message that this is what I want more of. There's a lot of good to be kept. So there's, and what you keep really is important. And half the time when I work with clients, I'm encouraging them to keep things. And why? Is because there's a part of them that's still resonating with it. And this comes up with memorabilia a lot. So I'm segueing into your specific examples or situations. Memorabilia, it's really at a, of really separating the wheat from the chaff on what to keep and what not to keep. And unfortunately, there's no bright line rules with it. And so what you're saying, a lot of stuff is from your past, China and all that stuff. And so what we tend to w- want to do is just give it to someone else like our kids and make them have to just make the decisions. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And so the younger generations must have signed a pact before they came in and said, we don't want any of this stuff. And that generation figured out themselves because there's more and more studies showing that the millennial generation and younger do not want the, the generational things. Usually people like to pick out their own things, but anyway, so my hunch is you're going to be having to make these decisions. (laughs) yourself and really what these items are they're actually wanting you to process them 
the items themselves are? Yeah, that's why they're still around. There are some viable things that your kids might want. But for the most part, they they are representing energy within you. And so that we mentioned the guilt, there might be regrets. There There is emotion that, that these items hold that's also emotion within yourself. And this is why we feel freer when we do release things. It's because we're releasing old emotions yeah. out of us. So I'm thinking giving these away to other people in the family, having a big party and bringing it all out and letting everyone pick out what they want might be a great way to do it after my daughters, maybe if they've picked out a few things that they want, because there's just a lot of stuff here. Yeah, but the problem is, is, is the people like yourself who will take things just for the sake of taking them. There's that one family member in every family that's the dumping ground for everybody else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's a big responsibility if you take it seriously. <laughs> I actually sat down with my great aunt before she passed and we did an inventory and she said, this is from Uncle Percy on our 35th wedding anniversary. I have it all archived that way. Yes, I so you can't take that to a Salvation Army. You just, you can't do that. Why can't you? It would, oh my gosh, she's watching. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not the first person to feel like this. <laughs> oh, from the dead? She's seeing it from the dead, you mean? From- right. Oh my gosh, yes. I promised I would take care of this stuff. And it's in this beautiful China cabinet. I have an inventory. I can't very well just take it to... A resale shop or something. So here's a little uh, tip. When it comes to gifts, if you feel guilty about getting rid of the item, uh, the unwanted item, then you feel guilty about it, then it's representative of some guilt within the relationship itself. So if I'm walking down the street and a stranger hands me a random picture and he's like, hey, take this. I'm going to be like, oh, okay, thanks. And then I'm going to take it to Goodwill the next day and I'm not going to feel guilty about it. But if great aunt or someone of, with there's some guilt within the relationship or within that family line, then it will show up through the items. So that's actually what you need to look at more than the item. It's there's something in that relationship or related people in that relationship that's bringing up the guilt, not the items. Wow. And you talk about sometimes you just need some time to allow the healing. Exactly. This is the thing. Yeah, th- this is, I'm not one of those that just let's bring a bulldozer and get everything out of the house. Like these items, especially these items we're talking about right here, they need time. This is a huge opportunity for healing and transformation. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Now, one of the things I'm, I'm sure a lot of people that are my age, I- We have to prepare for our own aging process, but a lot of us are dealing with our parents who are getting elderly and they need to downsize. And so you're having to move them into a smaller place. And so again, helping them select items to go into the downsizing. Is that something else that you help people with? Because there has to be so much emotion about that, especially if someone's been in a home for 40 or 50 years and you're the daughter coming in and and telling them they're downsizing and they get five boxes, for example, right? (laughs) Yeah, that was my life in 2017. It's very difficult. And I think really that's the unfortunately only answer is difficult and there's no way around it. And with older folks downsizing, like you're saying, their entire life is being culled down to a few items. And that's just, it's just really hard. It's really hard on the family members because they're dealing with all the excess stuff. There's this, there's a book that came out a couple years ago. That I'm going to get the name wrong, but the Swedish approach to death cleaning or whatever. And it's about decluttering so that as you get older, so your family members won't have to do it all for you. I think as decluttering is becoming more and more in our mainstream, I think that concept is becoming more on people's minds of not wanting to leave this all for your kids. And I think there's already that trend with baby boomers wanting to downsize anyway and moving and and simplifying. The fact that your word of the year is simplifying is very telling of the direction we're moving towards. But right now we are at a, we're at a perfect storm of certain generations, my generation, inherited items from the upline and saving things for your kids on the downline. And so it's all coming in. And then you're inheriting things 
of your own from your parents. Remember you said that? Yeah. <laughs> what happens when you inherit your own stuff? Oh, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, man, now I did my baby book and those bronze baby shoes. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Because they've been storing it for you. And now that you're helping them move into, let's say, independent living or assisted living, now you're going to end up getting your own things back that you never really yeah. had to deal with. And now you're having to deal with it. Yeah. And boy, oh. that's a that's an interesting process in and of itself, because it's the realization that you're the only one that cares about your stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> used to be, oh, your parents wanted to have your baby book. And now it's, oh, there's no one else that really cares about my stuff but me. And so it really puts the burden on yourself to ac- actually get real with your own stuff. It's like, what is important? Maybe but baby book? Yes. Baby boots? No. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about feng shui. And I hope I pronounced it right. But how can the average person apply it to their home? And how does the feng shui and the decluttering concept go together? Great question. When feng shui came about thousands and thousands of years ago, clutter was not such a big thing. It probably was a little bit, but not to the extent that it is now. And so you could have the perfect furniture arrangement, the perfect floor plan, all the perfect feng shui things you're supposed to do. But if you've got a lot of clutter, it's gonna, it's, that's the biggest energy block you're going to have in a house, okay? L- literally, physically, but also emotionally and mentally. So I always say that decluttering is step one to feng shui, all right? You got to remove the blocks so the energy flows. The analogy I always like to use is yoga. The purpose of yoga is removing blocks from our body so that the energy, the chi, the prana flows. This is the exact goal of feng shui, removing the blocks so that the energy can flow. And so clutter being the primary block in our home and clutter can also include furniture, you know, um, so that can be a big, literal, a big physical block. So decluttering. And in fact, if, if decluttering is the only thing you do, step one of feng shui, then you are so much better off. A lot of times, in fact, when I work with clients, that's all that needs to be done, like removing the clutter blocks so that then the energy starts to flow. Now we can then start to energize some spaces with some feng shui, little magic dust and things like that. But honestly, just getting the energy flowing is you're already going to be, you're already going to feel much better. It's going to get a little bit nuanced with the feng shui. There's what's called the Bagua map. And I won't go into too much detail except to tell you that if you put a tic-tac-toe board over your floor plan, this Bagua map will show you where every area of your life lies within your home. For example, the love corner, the wealth corner, the health corner, the um, career section and so forth. And so that can be one guide of where to look in your home for these clutter areas. But a more simple way is actually doing it by functions. In the beginning of the interview, I mentioned that I like to approach clutter, decluttering with respect to how you want to better your life. And so if it's with career, then you go to your home office or the place, it could be an offsite office, but if you have a home office, that's even more powerful. And you start there. Or if it's relationships that you're wanting to improve or attract, then you're removing blocks from that are blocking you from relationship. You would look into your master bedroom and the adjoining closet spaces to any of these. And so you, you begin the decluttering there. So looking to the room function and how it correlates to those function, functions in your life is a very quick and easy way to start the decluttering process. I was listening to you talk about the bedroom in the feng shui and not having photographs. I had the ancestors on the wall. (laughs) (laughs) And my daughter had put baby pictures on my dresser. They are all gone. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. It's whoever is pictured in your bedroom is their energy is literally in your bedroom. So whoever you don't want to be in your bedroom, get the pictures out. So have you seen people use feng shui and use the prosperity or relationship or health modalities, let's say, in their home? And have they seen really miraculous change in their life? Has has anyone shared a story with you? Oh, absolutely. I have one one example that comes to mind. Actually, it's one of my students. I love when I I teach a feng shui certification course. And as, as the class is going along, the students make changes to their house accordingly. And it's, I get so many testimonials from them. And one of the examples was one of the student's husband had been out of a job for some time. 
and sending out resumes. And so she moved his dad. It was like facing, it was not only just facing a wall, but it was facing like how attic spaces have that big angle. It was, he was like sitting under one of those facing a wall. She moved and arranged the desk. So it faces out. She added some lights and nice chairs and things like that. And literally the next day, he had multiple offers coming in. So what is happening there? We're shifting the energy somehow, literally changing it? It's, I'll tell you what's happening there, and, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible. And, because sometimes people make feng shui cures or, and, and, and nothing really happens. There's a combination of factors that take place. I've written extensively about this. It's called the Cosmic Trinity. And we have to take several factors into account, our human luck, our earth luck and our heaven luck. And when all three of those, with feng shui being the earth luck, which being 33%, and when all three of those kind of hit the bullseye, then that's when those big moments of life happen. We get the job, we meet the person or whatever. But the feng shui has to be in place. And so when it hits. We would love for you to share one last tip, a smart women tip. My tip is not to make decluttering a to-do list and approach it from perspective of what do I want to change in my life? So I think a lot of times we think of decluttering as just another thing to add to our to-do list. Instead, think about it as a manifesting tool. And to just do it ongoing every day, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great. So, uh, yeah. So I really want to thank you for being here today and sharing your wisdom. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So everyone, until our next show, please go out and live with more purpose, more passion, and prosperity. Smart Women Talk is brought to you by Smart Women's Empowerment, a 501c3 nonprofit project of United Charitable. Music by Bill Lucas from his album, When It Rains. Available on Apple, Music, and Spotify. Catch us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and be sure to join our free community at joinsmartwomen.com to access all our free Smart Women resources.